Okay, are the mics working? Yes? So you hear you heard all of our TTC, anti TTC okay. rent? Oh, we were microphone? Okay, I'm hot sorry. Mic. There's a hot mic. No, we heard you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Panel discussion about the new book, Animal Metropolis, Histories of Human-Animal Relations in Urban Canada. I'm Sean Karaj, and you are listening to episode 56 of Nature's Past, a podcast of the network in Canadian history and environment. To kick off the 2017 Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences in Toronto, Ontario, I joined two of the editors of a new volume on histories of human-animal relations in urban Canada published by University of Calgary Press earlier this year. Joanna Dean and Christabel Sethna invited me to join them to discuss this new open-access book and to have a broader discussion about the history of animals in cities. Well, thank you, everyone. I uh, really appreciate you being here uh, this early in the morning. Um, my name is Christabel Sethma, and I'm one of the co-editors of Animal Metropolis. Um, I'm also here with another co-editor, uh, Joanna Dean, uh, to my left, and one of the uh, contributors, Sean K. Raj, who was responsible for the book's epilogue. Um, we don't have our third co-editor here, um, Darcy, uh, Darcy Ingram. Uh, unfortunately, he could not be here, but I think he's with us in spirit. Can we say that? <laughs> um, um, I'd also like to thank the, uh, the contributors, and um, I would also like to thank Heather Hillsberg, who couldn't be here, and Heather was a graduate student at the time uh, that we began this this journey toward Animal Metropolis. She was a graduate student at the University of Ottawa in the Institute of Feminist and Gender Studies, and she was the one, um, during a discussion, came up with the idea, she came up with the idea of the theme, which is uh, urban animals. So we're very, very grateful to, to her. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank Sean. I think this is a really good way of coming full circle because uh, a few years ago, when I was thinking about doing something on animals, I, I turned to the internet to see what I could find. <laughs> and I, I stumbled upon a podcast of Sean uh, interviewing Darcy. And uh, I learned that Darcy was at the University of Ottawa. So he was one of my colleagues. I invited him out for lunch. And at lunch, Darcy said, great idea. Let's do something, yes and I want to bring someone else on board, Joanna Dean. And uh, we, we come full circle uh, this way. So we're each going to talk about our connection to the book and our contribution to the book. And so um, I wanted to talk about the, the chapter that I wrote for the book. I wrote about Jumbo the Elephant. And uh, for those of you who may or may not know this, um, Jumbo was uh, a uh, sort of a zoo and circus elephant. Uh, he was uh, called uh, the first international animal celebrity. And he was, I'm not giving anything away, he was killed uh, on September 15th, 1885 in St. Thomas, Ontario. And there is an enormous uh, statue, uh, a, a sort of a lifelike version of Jumbo at the entrance uh, to St. Thomas, which is a very small city in southern Ontario. And I thought a lot about why that statue was there, how it was that Jumbo, uh, an African elephant, came to St. Thomas. So I was really curious about his, his journey. And I'm particularly interested in, in representation uh, representations of animals, although this is not something that I normally do uh, in, my, in my work. And so just as a little aside, while I was on my way to, the, uh, to this book launch, I stumbled upon this little um, graphic. I don't know if you can see it, but it was at one of the booths 
and it's a little poster with which Sean tells me is from the First World War. Yes? First or Second. First or Second World War. <laughs> uh, first or Second World War. We are historians. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a graphic of a, of a beaver gnawing on a tree, and it says, Keep Canadians Busy. And uh, at the bottom it says, Buy from Independent Publishers. So it's been a bit, this poster's been a bit appropriated, I think. But anyway, it's an example of how easily we turn to animals to represent human activity. So I thought a lot about what Jumbo, Jumbo's journey to St. Thomas met, meant and, and what, um, what it meant to have a statue of Jumbo at the entrance to this small city in southern Ontario. And as I was doing the research, what I became really curious about, and this ended up, I think, being the most uh, salient aspect of my chapter, which is the connection between racialization and animalization. And in my, in my work, I'm quite fascinated by this notion of the great chain of being, uh, the notion that there are higher and lower orders of creation, um, and that certain human populations are seen as closer to animals evolutionarily, and that this supposed connection was used to rationalize, in many cases, uh, egregious um, uh, developments such as slavery. And I became curious as to the animal in that equation. So if we compare uh, humans to animals, um, in, in order to uh, lower the status of humans. What does it mean to the actual animal? Um, how do, if, 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 if human beings um, are animalized, then how is it that um, animals become racialized? And this is what I saw in the case of Jumbo. And Jumbo is this African elephant who's captured and ends up becoming a, a, an exhibit in London, um, after a very long journey um, out of Africa and then throughout Europe, he becomes this this beloved zoo exhibit, and then he becomes a circus elephant that ends up being killed in St. Thomas, Ontario. So that is, you know, in a broad sense, the story of Jumbo, and his his sort of animalization and racialization works, I believe, in concert with what happened to to specific populations of humans, slaves, and also individuals who were uh, described as freaks and often went on display um, in zoos and also in circuses. So that, in a broad sense, is my chapter um, on, on Jumbo. And I will stop there, and I welcome your comments and, and questions once we are um, through with our presentation. So thank you very much for being here this morning. Hi. My chapter is about horses. Nothing is exciting or as exotic <laughs> as elephants, but uh, mine die too, so there's a little bit of a comic thread there. <laughs> Coming to animal history, I think it's often the truism of academics. We talk about how much we learn from our students, but it is true. I had a student who was working on Emily Carr, and she wanted to do that old, tired old essay. Not tired, clearly the question of cultural appropriation is a lot, not a tired issue, but, but it's been talked about with relation to Emily Carr a number of times, and I really wasn't sure that that was something that would be such an innovative undergraduate paper to write. And the more she worked on Emily Carr, the more she noticed the animals. Emily Carr, famous landscape painter for those who don't know on the West Coast, um, Emily Carr had animals around her all the time. She painted trees all the time, but she lived with animals. She raised English sheep dogs. She had a monkey that used to hang around her shoulder. She pushed the puppies around the park in Victoria in a pram. She was clearly eccentric. She had a trailer she called the elephant. And uh, she would go off into the woods to paint, but she didn't live in the trailer by herself. She had puppies and dogs and monkeys and <laughs> a trailer full of animals. And my wonderful student, Amanda Sauerman, said, you know, why isn't anyone talking about the animals? And we both thought, well, you know, maybe it was a little bit embarrassing <laughs> that she was such an eccentric old lady surrounded by, by animals. 
And, uh, and Amanda went on to write a wonderful paper on Emily Carr and her animals. Actually, it started out being on Emily Carr, and then like all good papers, it morphed and became a paper that looked at animal breeding in Toronto, and what a middle class pursuit it was, the creation of purebred animal bodies, and then the, um, at the same time, the regulation and elimination of stray dogs in Toronto. So she did this wonderful morph from Emily Carr into animals, into dog regulation in, in Toronto at the turn of the century. And I followed Amanda into animals. I realized what an untouched subject it was and how interesting it was and just how much there was to explore and how much that could be said about the animals. And uh, the horse came about because I fell in love with horses at about this point in my life. Um, realized how ubiquitous they were in the city. Um, I, I worked Before this, I worked on tree history. And every tree that is planted, if you, if you look at pictures of 19th century cities, they have trees planted along every street, and every tree is surrounded by a fence. Every tree has a barrier around it. If you are in a very wealthy part of town, these are beautiful, ornate metal barriers around the trees. If you're in a less wealthy part of town, they're wooden ones. And I thought, isn't that interesting? They really like decorating their trees. They, they, you know, and of course, it was the horses. If you didn't protect your horse and the bark from animals, their bark would get chewed by the trees. So the, the horses were invisible in these paint, these, these photographs, but they were visible, their presence was shown by these barricades that were built around every single tree to keep them safe from the horses that were in the streets that might nibble if they got bored. Um, most of the work that was written on horses at this time, wonderful work, a man called Joel Tarr, about horses as a machine, and they were. They were industrial machines. They pulled everything. We, before the internal combustion engine, um, horses were the mid-power range. Humans did a lot of power lifting as well, but the horse was our main power source. They pulled things, pushed things, dragged things, hauled things in the city. And there were many, many, many horses in most cities. There were, I think, uh, I didn't check this, 18 per... Oh, I'm going to get it wrong if I come off the top of my head, but enormously high numbers of horses. Sean probably knows the number. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I won't put you on the spot. Um, so, Joel Tarr talked about horses as machines. Many people did. It was, it was fascinating. And at that time, in the 19th century, people were talking about horses as machines. They were interested in extracting every ounce of horsepower out of their horse, building the biggest horse, the best horse, fixing it up in the way that it could provide the most power. But of course, as somebody who was only then learning how to ride, I knew that horses were not machines. I knew horses had a lot of agency, and if horses didn't like the way they were being treated, they certainly let you know. These were not machines I was riding. I, I used to ride motorcycles, and they were a lot less scary than horses. Um, so I became very interested in the horse as a sentient animal, the horse's consciousness, the horse's agency, the horse's actions in the city. And to cut to my chapter, my chapter's looking at... I had done some earlier work on horses hauling, pulling, pushing. Um, this chapter is about horses that were used in medical production of biomedical products. And it's about the horses that were raised at the Connaught Laboratories. That was, um, the Connaught Laboratories were created around the time of the First World War, um, connected to University of Toronto. It was a, an offshoot of the university, um, created to produce biomedical products. They produced the anti antitoxin that saved so many children from diphtheria. They also produced the antitoxin that saved so many soldiers in the First World War from um, tetanus. They produced smallpox vaccine, and they went on to produce um, polio vaccine, an amazingly, extremely important international laboratory. Um, but nobody had looked really closely at the horses that were used in the production of this. Horses would be injected with diphtheria or tetanus, depending on what they wanted to produce. And the horse, being a massive animal, would produce mass massive amounts of antitoxin. And so they would build up the level of antitoxin in the horse's blood. And when it got high enough, they would bleed the horse. Not enough to kill it, not the first time. Uh, they would bleed the horse and extract the serum and produce antitoxin. And this saved many thousands of soldiers on, in, over in Europe. They shipped over tons of this stuff over to Europe. To, um, and every time a soldier was injured on the battlefield and had one of those deep lacerating wounds that so often turns into tetanus, he would be given a shot of his horse antitoxin. And for the most part, it was a miracle. Uh, the odd soldier was allergic to horse, 
and uh, his second shot wasn't so successful, but for the most part, they were extremely successful cures. And the horses did live through a number of bleedings before they were finally bled out in the lab. And my chapter looks at the process of using the horses this way and tries to get a handle at some of the relationships between those horses and the men who were working with them. Um, so that's probably enough about me and my chapter. Over to Sean. Okay. Uh, I wrote the epilogue for this book. Uh, Christabel uh, and I met at a pub in Toronto when Duke she was first uh, <laughs> thinking about the project and invited me to contribute a chapter and I politely declined uh, because I had already published um, a number of articles on animals. Uh, but then I think I said I could, I could maybe read the whole thing and then write a, an epilogue about the book. So uh, the epilogue in part sums up some of the, the chapters in the book, and there's several uh, great chapters, and I think that's one of the strengths of this book, is that it's quite wide-ranging in its approach to thinking about animals in cities. It covers a, a, a variety of different types of relationships, from material relationships to symbolic relationships, um, from economic history to cultural history to history of medicine and history of science. Um, but then I also use the epilogue as an opportunity to think through my own research on the history of animals in cities and cities, and to think about, in, in this case, what this book, uh, how this book contributes to two bodies of historical scholarship, uh, urban history and animal history, two subfields of history that don't often intersect or don't often speak to one another. And I thought that this book, in two ways, makes substantial contributions to showing uh, why animals matter in urban history and why cities matter in animal history. So the first half of that equation, there are a number of chapters in this book that provide ample evidence to show that urbanization in Canada was a multi-species affair, that cities are places that we think of as predominantly human spaces, in fact, almost exclusively human spaces, the epitome of artificiality, the destruction of nature, uh, and the walling off of humanity from its environment. But in fact, cities, as many of the chapters in this book show, were mixed environments that deliberately had people and animals. And in fact, they were co-developers of urban environments in Canada. And the horse, of course, is, I think, the preeminent example of that. The population of horses in the 19th century in Canadian cities goes up over the course of the 19th century as the human populations of cities grow. So as cities industrialized, and as they became not um, centers for congregations of thousands of people, but tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of humans for the first time uh, in North American history, um, they also were congregations of thousands and tens of thousands of horses and other animals, sheep, goats, uh, cows, uh, and one of the other big ones, chickens. Um, so for their labor and for their food especially, but also for their companionship, they were co-developers of urban environments. And Sherry Olson's chapter uh, illustrates that really well. She looks at uh, Montreal in particular and the urban geography and the ways in which streets and lanes were laid out uh, to accommodate uh, the pathways that animals would be traveling in cities. Um, so, and that's, that's one of the, the ways I came to this topic in animal history. I'm a historian of urban environments and I wanted to understand uh, cities uh, historically as ecosystems and so one of the ways I think we can do this is to look at animals and follow their histories in cities almost in the way that um, a doctor would use radioactive isotopes to follow your blood vessels you can take the animals and highlight them and see where they are in the cities to start to understand how cities operate as interrelationships between multiple species the other half of this book shows us why cities matter in animal history, and I think this is perhaps its bigger contribution. Animal history uh, and environmental history are two bodies of scholarship that travel in parallel but off very infrequently intersect, uh, which is odd, I think, in some ways. And I come at it from environmental history. And so when I first entered into this field, I was reading the scholarship in animal history and animal studies and was quite struck by the degree to which animal history and animal studies um, ignores or doesn't think about the ecological contexts in which the relationships between people and other animals take place. Animal history and animal studies purports to look at the historical relationships between people and animals, but often doesn't think about where those relationships occur. And this book situates all of those relationships within the context of different cities. And the environmental relationships are critical for understanding how human-animal relations change over time. 
So one of the examples I give in the epilogue is raccoons in Toronto. In the 19th century, in the early 19th century, uh, naturalist handbooks for the area around the town of York and later the city of Toronto describe the uh, raccoon as a not uncommon animal in the Toronto area, which when I first read that in this, uh, it was a 1910 uh, Natural History of Toronto, I found hilarious, right, from the 21st century perspective, because I think if you were writing that today, you would describe the raccoon as ridiculously overpopulated in Toronto. Um, and so it seemed to me that there's, a, there's an ecological history to the raccoon. In the 19th century, before the industrialization of the city, the raccoon is a wild animal uh, in with a moderate population. But over time, the animal became habituated to urban environments. It became a synanthrope, an animal that adapts to uh, human-built environments and thrives in those environments. Rats, pigeons, seagulls, squirrels, uh, cockroaches, bed bugs, these are all synanthropic species that live in an inadvertent co-evolutionary relationship with people. So that relationship over time leads for the raccoon to quite a good story, a bloom of the population and its growth. But its relationship with people changed as a result of that. As the raccoon became habituated to human environments, people stopped thinking of them as wild animals that you would hunt wild animals whose fur you would use for clothing. Advertisements at Eaton's in the early 20th century had raccoon uh, fur fashions, something you wouldn't see today. Um, and the zoos, the Riverdale and High Park zoos had raccoon displays, which again is something in Toronto I think would be quite humorous to see people coming and gathering to see a raccoon. And there's a, a great small newspaper article from 1895 I think that I talk about in that chapter uh, about a raccoon that climbs on top of a telephone pole on Queen and Berkeley, uh, and a crowd gathers to watch it uh, as a man climbs up to bring it down. Now, there's certainly a spectacle to a guy climbing up a telephone pole to bring down a raccoon, so that might gather people. But the animal itself drew people's attention and caught their eye in a way that a raccoon today is so ordinary and so boring, a crowd of people wouldn't gather around to see it. So again, the relationship between people and this animal changed such that by the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, they were pests. Um, pests that people were killing violently, pests that cities were trying to come up with ways to get rid of. Um, and then Christabel pointed out this uh, odd case of the raccoon carcass that was on Church Street up near Young and Church, just north of Bloor, uh, where a raccoon had died and was on a sidewalk, and people made a makeshift impromptu memorial to it. Uh, and put flowers in its hand and gave it a name and posted pictures of it on Twitter and other online social networks. Um, all of which is to say that the, that changing relationship between people in Toronto and this particular animal can't be understood without understanding how the environments in which people and that animal changed as well over the course of 150 some odd years uh, in Toronto. And this book, more broadly speaking, illustrates that. To understand human relationships with animals, we have to think about the environments in which those relationships occur, because they're not just uh, bipart relationships between people and animals, they are relationships among people, animals, and, uh, and uh, environments. Um, and the cities in particular, I think, are really valuable. The chapters that look at, uh, I think, Will Knight's chapter on the Fish Museum, um, uh, Christabel's chapter on Jumbo, uh, the chapter on the Vancouver Aquarium, uh, Jason, Jason Colby. Yeah, Jason Colby's chapter. They show <laughs> ways in which the relationships between animals and people people uh, were uh, were deeply implicated with cities through spectacle. Um, where most Canadians' engagements with wild animals and exotic animals happen in zoos and aquariums, um, and so a lot of scholarship in animal history in Canada, especially. Um, does focus on these more charismatic and symbolic animals like the beaver and the moose. We have lots of literature on the fur trade, but most Canadians in the 20th century only encounter those animals symbolically in zoos or on coinage uh, or in posters. Um, and again, this book highlights some of that and draws out the connections to uh, urbanity and urban life um, in shaping human-animal relations. So that's how I wrapped up the book in the epilogue. I don't know if it did justice to the quality of the chapters in this book, but uh, it was something that stood out to me when I read it. Nature's Past is produced with support from the Network in Canadian History and Environment. This episode was made by Joanna Dean, Christabel Sethna, and me, Sean Courage. 
Music for Nature's Past was licensed by Creative Commons. For details on the artists, please take a look at our show notes page at niche-canada.org slash nature's past, where you can also download new episodes, subscribe to the podcast wherever great podcasts are found, and leave comments. You can also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash nature's past. You can always find out more about the environmental history research community in Canada from the Niche website at niche-canada.org. And you can find out more about the topics we discussed on this episode on our show notes page. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Nature's Past. Nature's Past.